Well, we are going to uh, figure it out. But I'm in the sorry. meanwhile, yeah. um, tell us how you're doing. How How is the family? I, I'm doing good. Yeah, the, the family is good. It's my kids are sort of uh, summer in Montana, summer spread out. And so, um, you know, they've all been dealing with the, the shutdown and, and, you know, all of the, uh, the crazy stuff craziness of the news cycle, but everyone's happy, healthy, and um, doing really well. And Montana's super nice right now. I mean, it's sunny, it's beautiful, we're already socially distant, so we didn't get hit very hard by COVID at all. Um, there, unfortunately, it did hit a couple you know, areas, uh, like nursing homes and things like that, but it, overall, the whole state, um, our governor shut things down really early, so we felt very fortunate. Very good. Well, I'm glad glad to hear it. It is yeah. definitely an interesting time. Yeah. So we, we're going to start our conversation, and you already know what I look like. Not a problem. Can you see me? I can see you. Oh, okay. As long as and I think everyone me. else can see you, okay. so, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. I can't see anyone, but here I am in my office. Go ahead. Good okay. to see you. Great. All right. Well, and very good. Okay. So you were in Gettysburg last September oh, and Tony DeLacy, who's on this Zoom with us, Tony is our official, unofficial Adams County Library Battlefield Tour Guide. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know, um, with the tour that Tony gave you, what, what do you remember the most about get the Gettysburg Battlefield? Oh, you know, when I look at, at uh, well, the, the the strategic things I, I remember, and I, I love the little details of the battlefield history of, you know, the mountains were here and they used the mountains as cover and came up from this direction. And I just, you know, I like all of that. But when I look at an area like that, I like to look at what it, I try to envision what it looked like all those years ago. The trees were smaller, the trees were decimated, the roads, you know, the visitor center wasn't there. Um, I, I try to sort of go back in time and, and try to picture it. Um, you know, in its, in its previous natural state. Um, and for me, that's, you know, that's really, uh, that's kind of the fun part. Because um, I, I, you know, I write historical fiction, so I, I, I'm sort of have one foot in the past anyway. And so um, places that have such deep history are always you know, on my bucket list. Yeah, it's a, it's a real privilege to live here for sure. And we're yeah, glad it's, visited. it's a great town. I mean, it's a, it's a place that I, as soon as I was there, I, I messaged my wife, like, okay, we got to come back here. <laughs> my, my, my cousin lives, um, uh, I have cousins that live north of there, and I'm like, okay, we need to make a, a family trip or something like that. We will take you anytime. Definitely let us know. Cool. So regarding your first novel, which is <laughs> fabulous, a Hotel oh, on the you. Corner of Bitter and Sweet. So uh, bring us up to date with the theatrical musical <laughs> and the film adaption. Mm. What's going on? Wow. Um, I've, I've learned new contractual language um, <laughs> because of COVID. Um, there's a term that, a Latin term I've never heard of and most people never heard of, even that work in the industry called uh, force majeure, which means if there is a natural disaster or some other thing, it can push the production back um, contractually. And so I guess, like everything in Hollywood has been um, using that, that clause to push production back. So it was in early pre-production. Um, I think that the screenwriter's done with the latest version of the, of the script. We have a director, um, you know, they're, you know, we, we, we have uh, investors that have uh, invested money for development. Um, the financial component that's really in the hands of, of the producers. Um, I'm an executive producer, but I'm in the mix more for story and creative than the monetary nuts and bolts of the thing. Um, they'll go into production as soon as they can, but it, you know, they were hoping that maybe they would be shooting this fall. Um, that may not happen. That probably won't happen. It'll probably the soonest be next year. Um, the, there was a musical, uh, I should say there is a musical, and it's, it was scheduled for the 2021 season at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle. Um, it's probably gonna be pushed back a year as well. Um, that one, it went really well. Um, there were two developmental performances in New York City. I was fortunate to go and, and, and watch them. And the second one was for big theater investors because there are people that, um, you know, that back these big productions. 
and it was impressive. They they did a, a, a walkthrough performance, and um, people, I, I'm metaphorically, um, they didn't, I'm sure they wired the money or something like that, or however they they do it. But yeah, they raised. Um, I can't remember the, the number, like $1.8 million that night. Oh. Um, that doesn't go to me. It goes to, you know, the, to produce uh, a Broadway size scale uh, musical, which I think, you know, takes about like $6 million. So this is the okay. first step. Um, and, but it'll premiere in Seattle. And if it does really well, which I hope it will, then it'll bounce to New York City. And um, that's pretty exciting. Excellent. We're, we're ready to go to Seattle to see it. <laughs> Yeah, I've been to the theater there. I've seen a couple shows there. Um, it's it's a wonderful, you know, classic old theater that's been, uh, you know, brought back to life a couple decades ago. Um, and I, I love musical theater. So it's it's really, I mean, most people are very excited about the thought of a film, but I'm, I'm more excited about the musical. I love that. That's good. We, yeah, the world needs more musical theater. <laughs> it does. It does. So staying with hotel, mm -hmm. oh, check out that mug. Oh, wait. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers to everyone at home. Whether mm -hmm. it could be, is it a, is it a mule? Your favorite, your favorite? Mug <laughs> <of mule? laughs> uh, my my brother-in-law is coming over for his birthday later tonight. And uh, we'll probably have some sort of uh, fun beverage. But for right now, it's just mineral water. Diet Coke for me, actually. Yep. Okay. Yep. Very good. Okay. So speaking, staying with Hotel in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. So it's read in schools across the country. Mm -hmm. Knowing that now, is there anything that you would have changed? Oh, you know, this is an interesting question. I, uh, since, since the COVID, uh, you know, stay at home. I mean, I, I traditionally, I, I will Skype with a, a school maybe once a month, but now I've been doing a couple a week um, and, I, and I'm happy to do it. And that's been a lot of it's it's fun. I like being homework. It's it's kind of a you know it's an odious blessing, but it is a blessing, and I appreciate it. Um, I what what happens is schools will sometimes assign uh, as an assignment kids to write one extra chapter of where the story would go, and then they will send those to me, and those have been great. Um, but I don't you know there's a couple anachronisms, and there's one typo that I would yeah, I would fix. Um, if I was, you know, I, there's a part of me that if I could go back in a time machine, I would want to take another run at it, that I would rewrite it a little bit because I think I've grown as a writer and, um, and I'm a better writer. That being stated, I might've made it, um, put something in it that made it less accessible perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend not to think in terms of of changing it because that's where I was in 2006 with my with where my heart was, where my emotional interest was, where my my skills as a writer, um, and hopefully you know you evolve and grow as as a creative person. I I I I tend to say that before the Beatles had you know their great albums like Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, they were writing songs like She Loves You, Yeah Yeah Yeah, and you start out here and you you allow yourself to grow. So I'm still in the growth phase. Well, that was a brilliant start. <laughs> Very much. It yeah. was, uh, you know, sometimes the, you can't manufacture a zeitgeist moment. That's the one thing I've learned is you can just do the best work you can. You can only control your relationship to the work and you can, your relationship to uh, readers and fans. You can't control the relationship of fans to the work. That's, it's theirs. And um, that, that book, it just, it just had one of those moments. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm super fortunate because of that. And we are too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So with love and other consolation prizes, and for you at home, if you haven't mm -hmm. read this yet, read this book. So um, I reread it during this pandemic. Awesome. And it broke my heart again. Mm -hmm. You know, every page just kind of, you know, strikes, strikes an emotional chord. It's, it's beautiful. Um, one of Ernest's daughters, Juju, is a reporter, and she discovers her father's incredible story. And I wanted to read, a pa read from page 41 and then ask you a question, if I may. Okay. So here she is. Dad, you know me better than that. I'm as careerist as anyone, but this isn't all about me, and it's not all about you. It's about what those reporters had in common. 
They weren't afraid to turn over a few rocks and look at the squishy things underneath. It's about all the marginalized people who never get their stories told properly. So my question for you is, and um, obviously, Jamie, you write stories about the marginalized, and there is so much collective pain in the world mm -hmm. right now. Uh, what's your perspective, both as a writer and an historian, about the stories and the headlines right now? Mm. I, you know, uh, I, I don't consider myself a, a social justice warrior. I consider myself a history warrior. And I think the more we, we remember and study and learn from the past and understand, um, you know, it's very easy to react to what's happening now without understanding why it's happening. And the historical context for me, that's where I find answers. And that's where I, 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 need, I need a better explanation than just people are mad or people are bad. Um, cops are mean or cops are good. There, there's, it's just much more complex than that. And um, I was asked to speak at a rally here in Montana. We had a very peaceful rally, um, a huge turnout, which was really heartening here in Montana. And I, I, I did some digging and for part of my speech, and I realized that Montana does have a rich history of, of being independent. You know, when, when Birth of a Nation premiered, like in uh, 1906, I can't remember the, the exact date, but there were, there were protests here in Montana at that time over the depictions of, of Black people. Um, and I, I thought that was very interesting. Montana's always had a very, uh, you know, had a very... You know, didn't didn't become a state until you know twenty something years after the end of the Civil War, but it's had a, a unique perspective, and so I I use that moment to look at uh, my own family. Um, my family grew up in a, a red line neighborhood, and what I sometimes do when I'm giving talks and a, a question like this comes up, I will ask the audience, like, who here knows what a what a red line neighborhood is? And typically, only twenty. I'm, actually 10%, maybe 20% of the people will know what a red line neighborhood is. And, and that's because you didn't grow up in one. And so some people would say that's privilege. I would just say it's, it's, you just, it's an unawareness and, it, or you could say it's ignorance and it's not their fault because it wasn't taught in schools. It's barely taught now. But a red line neighborhood was where in 1936, 1934, I think, um, forgive me if I get a couple years off, 1934, the federal government had 239 cities create maps of uh, a risk assessment, assessment for their entire city. And there were neighborhoods labeled A, B, C, and D, and D were labeled in red, and those were deemed hazardous. And those were always the neighborhoods of people of color. Um, and what happened over the next 50 years was banks used those maps to deny the people who live in those neighborhoods uh, business loans and housing loans, and in many cases, uh, school funding. And so it really kneecapped the people that lived in these communities for a generation, maybe two generations. And I, I grew up in one of those neighborhoods and, I, and this applied not just to people of color that you would think of black or Chinese or Filipino or Korean, it sometimes applied to Jewish Americans and sometimes applied to Italian Americans. And so there were just people that were held back from, you know, they'd had to fight really hard to even reach the middle class. They were stuck in service oriented jobs in the lower class until um, you know, the late sixties um, with uh, you know, the civil rights, civil rights act had an equal housing amendment in there that um, change things. But even that wasn't enforced fully until the 70s and 80s. And so I look at these neighborhoods and, and there's a reason for the rage. And there's a reason for, um, you know, I, I'm surprised something like this hasn't happened sooner, but it's the, the advent of the cell phone um, catching moments where people are being treated very unfairly because of, um, you could argue, that it's poverty of their social standing, but it really is is race as well. And so I think by having an understanding of that, you know, you have empathy for the people that live there and you want to help them and you see them as Americans. Um, without that knowledge, you just see behavior and that's how it's easy to look at people and say they're less than an American or that these police are all bad because you don't really appreciate the underlying um, examples. I mean, I can, 
my, my cousin, um, he is a, uh, an attorney who has argued two cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and one of those cases was um, about Ferguson, Missouri, where there was a lot of political, I should say, racial unrest. Um, and in Ferguson, Missouri, there were um, laws to fight urban blight. And so there were laws where you could ticket homeowners for their grass is too long, their paint is peeling, um, a window's cracked. If they don't have matching curtains, you can find them, give them a ticket. And then the city of St. Louis assigned a quota to their police officers, which, I mean, that's, it's not their fault. It's the, their, the government's fault. And so the police officers, naturally, they want to fulfill their quota so they can get onto the work of policing. So they would come out of their neighborhood and roll through Ferguson and ticket people. And it became a form of unfair taxation on this neighborhood. And that's a, a lot uh, I mean, that's, that's a classic example of systemic racism. And if you don't live there, it's not part of your lived experience. If it didn't affect you or your family, then it's very easy to think that that doesn't exist and that doesn't happen to people because it didn't happen to you. So anyway, I just think um, we need to be gentle with one another. We need to lead with, lead with love um, and understand that there's, there's systemic problems beneath what's happening on the streets right now. And, and I think it's about time that, you know, they're really addressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that's a long answer. Sorry, but uh, okay. but thank you. It's well, a complex thing, so it requires kind of a, a complex answer. Absolutely. And if you think of something else you want to share, let us know. <laughs> well, when yeah, when I called when I called you, we had our first pandemic. Um, <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. it's it's just a it's well. And how how has the pandemic changed your reality? Oh, you know the the the. The funny thing is I was at Yaddo, which is a, a writing residency in upstate New York. I was there um, from the middle of January to the middle of March, right before the big shutdown. And when I was there, I was paying close attention to what was happening in Seattle, because that's where I'm from. And that's where the, the first outbreak was, aside from the cruise ship, but you know, the first outbreak, the first death in the US. And there was a writer at Yaddo from Beijing, and he had quarantined as was required there, and he quarantined himself here. But he brought 30 masks for all of us because he saw this coming. Mm -hmm. um, and he tried, and he was telling us this, and I was the only one that believed him because I was from Seattle and I was, I was concerned. Most of the people there were from the East Coast and it, it seemed a million miles away. Mm -hmm. And so people had, you know, vacation plans or uh, had bought tickets to, you know, uh, for travel and, and, he was, we would watch the news and he was saying, I've seen this movie, guys. I know how this is going to end. It's going to shut down your country. And I took him seriously. Um, I flew home with my mask and he told me, don't eat any open food in the airport, only eat packaged food. And people looked at me on the plane like I was a crazy person because <laughs> I was the only one wearing a mask. But, um, but I took it seriously. It helps that I'm married to a, a nurse. Uh, with an advanced degree in biology, and she saw it coming too. And um, I went back and looked at our text messages from that time, and she's she's calling it like, okay, it's here in Seattle, it's in the community here. It's probably an infection rate is about this. It's going to be serious. It's not going to, you know, this isn't uh, the Spanish flu because it's not a hemorrhagic fever. And she speaks in all these medical terms, and I just learned to trust her because she's an expert. Um, that being stated, I get home. Um, I had three events in Seattle that I reached out to them and said, I, I think we need to look at these. And they were like, it's all good. And then the next week is we're getting together to consider options. And then the next week they all, they all canceled. Um, and I, I came home and um, I hate to say it, but for me personally, it's been a wonderfully productive time because I travel so much and without the travel, I just, I'm just in this space, this office working every day. Um, and when I write, I tend to write seven days a week. I'll write just a little on Saturday and a little on Sunday, but I, I stay in the story. So because of COVID, I probably had my most productive two months ever. Um, I had to turn, I, I had to, I get up at five or six every morning to work and I had to discipline myself to where I'm not going to touch my phone, I'm not going to touch my email, I'm not going to look at the news, I'm not going to look at anything until... I've hit, um, you know, uh, where I want to be with my work for the day. So I wouldn't look at the news till two or three in the afternoon. So I wasn't distracted by, 
um, the latest uh, updates. I, I wasn't putting my head in the sand. I caught up in the afternoon and the evenings, but I just couldn't look at it that early in the morning because it would just, uh, you know, it sidetracked me for the rest of the afternoon. So you probably can predict what I'm going to ask next. Okay. So tell us what you've been writing. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your new book. Oh, yeah, new book. Um, yeah, I, I signed a new two-book deal. Uh, this time I, 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 I have moved to Simon & Schuster from Random House. Um, I, I, I wanted to write a, a book that's a little different for me. I, 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 I write historical fiction, but this new book is historical, but it's also speculative. So it goes from around 1836 and there's a bunch of time periods and it also, and we end up in 2045. So it's a little bit into the future. And that, I think, Random House, I think, thought I was going to write, you know, a, a Clockwork Orange or Blade Runner or something like that. It's not that. It's just a little further in the future. Traffic's worse and <laughs> um, <laughs> there's more drones. Um, and, and so it's, it's not science fiction. It's just a, a, little, a, a little bump. And there's reasons in, in the book for why I needed to do that. Um, the new book is, a, is another, you know, multicultural historical story. The sort of the, the Genesis character is a woman named Afong Moy, who was the first Chinese woman to set foot in America. And she was brought to America at a time when it was illegal for women to leave China. It was a, it was a crime punishable by death. So you were not allowed to leave, but somehow she ended up um, in the U.S. And she had several handlers who took her around and, and hosted these salons where um, they would, you know, look at her bound feet and she would sing or play a musical instrument and interact. And she eventually learned a, a fair amount of English. But no one really knows what happened to her. Um, her last, I mean, it, her life, I'm sure, ended in tragedy. Um, you know, the rumors were that she was, you know, she was abandoned on the street and, and at some point she, she died probably in a poor house. Um, but this book um, is basically, it follows the path of many of her descendants over all these generations. And the book is about um, generational trauma or epigenetics, which is, um, you know, it's really a, a new field of study, um, not just in genetics, but also in, you know, clinical psychology of, of, of how much of our behavior is inherited. Um, not just learned, but inherited, and how much of that is affected by trauma, and how much of our current behavior is affected by trauma of the past. And so it it follows sort of the this original sin of trauma and how it ripples through all these generations. So that's the new book. I'm almost I'm about 300 pages into it. I'm supposed to turn it in like at the end of next month. I'm I'm probably going to miss my deadline, um, but not by much. And um, that's, I, I already have kind of an idea for my next book after that, but I, but I, I have ideas all the time and I write a little note in a notebook and I, I go back later and find out if I'm a crazy person or not. That sounds fascinating. We look forward to reading it for sure. Thanks. And um, as we were chatting the other day, you mentioned a couple other projects. Um, tell us about mm. those. So the, um, so you're a poet. <laughs> um i am i don't know if i mentioned it when i was in in gettysburg in person when i was in the fourth grade my parents sent me to poetry camp um they had such a thing and i was the type of kid that they sent to poetry camp um so i've i've been a fan of poetry i mean i i i read it i listen to it i write it but i never share it and um there was a collection that someone put together um, called Alone Together, some stories um, written kind of about, uh, about the COVID shutdown and how people are acting and surviving. And all of the money goes to independent bookstores. And um, so I wrote a piece for that. So that will be my first published poem since high school. <laughs> I think that's um, great. Yeah, I feel very... Uh, I feel very exposed at the moment, but, um, but it was fun. And uh, another one, I have another uh, story coming out in a collection that's, I think it's available for pre-order now at your local bookstores, wherever you buy books. Um, it's called Stories from Suffragette City. And it's a collection uh, and it has a, 
bunch of great authors in there, like Lisa Wingate, who wrote uh, Before We Were Yours, and Kristen Hanna, who wrote The Nightingale, um, Chris Bojalian, who's written 20 books. Um, I was really happy to be, to be part of this collection, but it's set um, in 1919, uh, all the stories during this great suffragette parade that took place in New York City. And so the book is going to come out on the 100th anniversary of, of, of women having the right to vote. And we all uh, wrote about a real historical character. So I chose a woman named Mabel Lee, who was a Chinese suffragette. Mm -hmm. She rode her horse. She marched in Washington, D.C. She came to this country when she was four and um, ended up being the first woman to get a doctorate from Columbia University. Um, and she fought for the right of women everywhere to vote, even though as a Chinese person, she could not vote. So she was a fascinating character. So I was, I was, uh, I was excited. Um, naturally, I am, you know, I have a Y chromosome. I'm, I'm not a, a woman. And so it's predominantly the voices of female authors, but they did choose a couple male authors to contribute. And I was, I was really, you know, I was really honored to be, uh, to be selected. Yeah, that is an honor. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It felt like I'm, <laughs> you know, being a sensitive boy in high school is not uh, the greatest thing. Being a sensitive man as a writer, it's like my superpower. So, um, you know, we grow into these things. Yeah, you um, you pull the emotional strings, like I said, almost every page. <laughs> Sometimes it's you know, it's great. It's great. And, and um, it's very much appreciated. And, and Thank you. the stories are just really interesting as well. And, you know, for me, you totally nail that young um, male, uh, the protagonist voice. Um, it's one of my favorite parts. Thank well, you. Well, we do have a yeah, have questions. Of aspiring writers on, um, on the Zoom. So cool. what, what advice would you give to those aspiring writers that are listening to you right now? Mm. Um, <laughs> I don't mean this facetiously, but if I can do it, you can do it. Um, I don't have, I don't have a degree in creative writing. I don't have a degree in English. Um, I don't have a four-year degree. Um, my, my, my training is in design. I come at writing from an art background. And so I'm truly a self-taught writer and, but so was Hemingway. So was Shakespeare's most in there. I have a son who's a musician and you know, most of the, the musicians playing in bands today, they don't have a degree, they don't have an MFA in, in music. Um, some of them do, but most of them, they just, they just work at it. And so, I mean, fundamentally, I, I, I tell people when you're, you have to allow yourself to have some bad notes. If you're a musician, you have to have some clunkers at the piano. And a lot of times as musicians, you sit at the piano and you, you know, um, you don't play Rachmaninoff right away. You know, you start off with really something simple like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and, you're, and you work your way up. With writing, a lot of times uh, people that approach, you know, wanting to write a, a book, they try to write Rachmaninoff right out of the gate. When they fail at it, they say, I guess I'm not a writer. And that's not how it works. You, you have to allow yourself to fail, allow yourself to have some bad notes and just keep at it. Um, it's a learned craft. It's like playing a musical instrument. You just have to put the time in. Um, and I, 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 I know a lot of writers that are published, very successful writers, that the book they're known for is not the book that they started out with. You know, they might have written ten books before they ever got published. Um, I before I wrote Hotel in the Corner, Bitter and Sweet, I wrote another novel that will never see the light of day. Um, and it's a, it's a terrible book. No one should have to read that book. Um, I haven't even let my wife read that book. But it, I, but it was practice, and it's what I needed to get behind me to get on to the next book. And um, I really look at it like that. Also, if, you, if some, anyone out there is considering, considering an MFA program, I have nothing against MFA programs uh, by and large. I have... Uh, I do have a, something against how much MFA programs cost. I, I'm not sure if it's worth the money. Um, it depends on where you go, of course. Um, and <laughs> there's, a, there's an author um, that uh, lives in uh, <laughs> Greensboro named Orson Scott Card. He writes science fiction and fantasy. And um, he told me this when I was trying to figure out 
how to be a, an author, how to write. He said, don't go to an MFA program first. Go to a garage sale and buy three books, pay no more than a nickel a piece, and force yourself to read them as a writer and try to pick them apart. And his thesis, his belief was that if you do that, if you pick apart all the, the bad things about this, knowing that someone paid this author to write it and paid money to publish it, and someone paid money to buy it, um, but if you pick apart all these things, when you sit down the keyboard or the typewriter or the yellow legal pad, you'll catch yourself making the same mistakes. And I did that and it worked for me. Um, it didn't turn me into a best-selling author overnight, but it, it definitely improved my writing and it cost 15 cents. Uh, so um, I highly recommend that. Very fun. Yeah, that's, that is great. Did, plus, you, and, plus, you and, might find something cool at a garage sale. So there's always there that you too. Go. And are you literally making notes in those those five cents books? Because otherwise, I would say go to your library, of course. And get books. <laughs> yeah, don't mark up the books at the library. Um, I I did that as a college student. I marked up books from the Seattle Public Library, and as a adult and published author, I later donated fifteen hundred dollars to the <laughs> Seattle Public Library to make up for all the books I marked up as a nineteen year old. Um, I love that. That's good. Yeah, but I, I do. I mark. I mark them up, and um, there's some utility in doing that. It was. I, it was super helpful for me. I, I think it's a. It's a good way to go. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice. Did you have any mentors for your writing? And I want to get back to what art you created too. But let's mm. the writing theme. Um, the closest thing I had to a mentor, and it wasn't really a mentor, but it was someone that just gave me the right encouragement at the right time. Um, it was Scott Card. Um, I went to a writing workshop in uh, Buena Vista, Virginia in 2006. He used to do it every year. I don't know if he still does it, but you have to write, send him a writing sample to get in and he accepts maybe 10 people and he works with you for a week. And he calls it a, a literary boot camp. And he's not, I mean, it's, um, you know, I like history. So it's in Virginia. I called um, the people that, are running this and I asked them, you know, what is, what is there around Buena Vista, Virginia? What can I see, you know, do something touristy with my spare time. And the woman on the other side of the phone laughed at me. She said, you will have no free time. And we didn't, we were in the classroom from probably eight in the morning to at least six. Um, sometime one, one time we went from eight in the morning till 11 at night. And then we have to write through the night. And then we have to get up early, maybe, you know, four in the morning to read other people's works. So we can critique them. It was, wow. That's it was, crazy. and he's there. He's in the classroom the entire time. And he's, he was just, you know, I, I went to that workshop and I, I went as a writer and I left as a storyteller. And I owe a lot of that to, to Scott Card. He, um, um, he had a Robin Williams level of energy in the classroom. And so it was, uh, there was also someone else was there who had a, a degree in English from a, a four-year university and he basically said he's like I we just got two years of you know instruction in in 10 days wow is Scott Card still offering these writing boot camps um you know I'm not sure I know he had a, a very minor stroke not that long ago and even after that he was still doing it but I'm, I'm just not sure um, these days. Um, and, and maybe the other person that wasn't really a mentor, but was, um, he was just, you know, kind and encouraging to me when it mattered most. And that was Pat Conroy, uh, who I, I loved his writing. Um, I, you know, I was so intimidated the first time I met him and he was just the most gracious, kindest, most heartwarming Southern gentleman. Um, I, I just, I, Pat Conroy is, um, you know, some, sometimes people have dreams and in their dreams they're flying. And in my dreams, I'm writing like Pat Conroy. So that's, um, you know, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Awesome. Well, what are you reading now? Ooh, what am I reading now? Mm -hmm. um, wow. Uh, as, as I suddenly look around my office at all the books. Oh, wait, um, are you going to show us Red Shoes? Because if you follow Jamie Ford on Facebook <laughs> or Instagram, you know he has red shoes. Well, um, 
I, I don't just have red shoes. I have red shoes, and I have red slippers in my office. So I, I, I have, I, have I, I just always have red shoes. It's my favorite color. Um, as far as books, um, it, it's unfair sometimes to recommend the books that I've been reading because you can't get your hands on them just yet because uh, they're advanced reader copies. And so um, let me look at this book here. Um, <laughs> uh, trying to look at what the most recent one was. Sorry, I'm staring at my computer and that's rather rude and I, I should not do that. Um, I, if anyone had read the book Bird Box by Josh Mallerman or saw the movie on Netflix, um, he wrote a sequel now. And so I got my hands on an early copy of that and it's fantastic. If you like the movie or you like the book, you'll love the sequel. It's just as good. Um, other books that I've been reading, um, I don't have it here. I wish I had it here at Dancer, but it's um, one that was recommended to me by a friend. It's called An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's one of those books that I think is really necessary because we were taught the history of the, you know, the conquerors, the, the, the colonists, um, you know, the, we're not really taught the history of, of the people that, you know, were moved from one reservation to another. And their history, their, their point of view. Um, and I, and I think that's, that's useful. I, I really, I'm not a big fan of going back and putting people, historical figures on trial for laws today. You know, I, I, um, people in the past use the language of the past and the structure of the past, and it's our job to learn from the past. And so, um, a book like that, I think is really helpful. Um, I, I just picked up a book, uh, Children of Virtue and Vengeance by uh, Tomi Adeyemi. And I read a lot of young adult books. I started when my kids were young adults and, or teenagers. And so every once in a while, I just pick up what, um, you know, my local bookseller recommends is like, you know, the best of the best. Um, and this is one that he recommended. Um, so Did yeah, you I'm- read Turtles All the Way Down? You know, I, I didn't. That's one of the few John Green ones I didn't read. I, I have a signed copy and I, I went and saw John Green when he came to Montana and he's, I mean, it was a, it was a wonderful event. Um, but I, I haven't. I read, you know, uh, Looking for Alaska and Baltimore Stars and Paper Towns. Um, but yeah, I think he's a fabulous writer. He is. I wept like a baby. Oh my gosh. I, I can't handle it, but it's really good for me. With turtles uh, all the way down? Um. It, fault, no, Fault in My Stars. Oh, fault, yeah, Fault in Our Stars, I read to my wife out loud in an afternoon over like three hours. We, I, I read the first part and I'm like, oh, this is so good. I'm like, sit down, let me read this to you. I think you're going to love this. And then she just kept going and we read the whole book and we're just both like in tears. It was not a bad way to spend the Saturday afternoon in the winter. That is very sweet. Tell Alicia, by the way, that we really appreciate her, you know, her work on the front lines too. Be sure to let her know. Yeah. Yeah, she's, uh, you know, she was supposed to be in Bangalore, India right now with a team of nurses and couldn't travel, obviously, because of COVID. So she's, um, you know, she's doing work um, on the home front now. Very good. Well, I have work to do and it's to get to our question. Okay. So All my right. colleague Sarah is going to help me with that. We'll see. Um, so Sarah, do we have any questions? We certainly do have questions. Um, Rebecca would like to know, as a historian who tries to see things as they were, how do you expect future generations will find a positive takeaway from the COVID-19 pandemic? And what will be the never do that again takeaway? <laughs> um, you know, I think it depends on the second wave. Um, in Montana, we, a uh, state of a million people, we only had less than 600 cases. We had 17 fatalities. Um, our governor took it really seriously and shut schools down. Um, just, I mean, just erring on the side of caution. Um, things are opening up again. Um, I went to a restaurant last night with a friend. Um, everyone's spaced out and we wash our hands and things like that. Um, but we noted how many people don't wash their hands. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll know my Montana is a tourist state. So we're going to get as is Gettysburg, you're going to get a lot of people coming and the, 
the hot spots now in Montana are all people from out of state. And no one knows how bad this next wave is going to be. The, the, the idea with flattening the curve wasn't to prevent it. It was just to lengthen it out so it doesn't impact us all at once. And so I think, you know, I think we'll look back on this as, um, you know, this was a dress rehearsal for the bird flu or something that has a higher fatality rate or has a hemorrhagic fever. And we failed the dress rehearsal. So um, I hope we can look back on this and realize that <sighs> with a pandemic, it's not about being right and wrong. It's about being safe. And so there are a lot of people that want to be right. They want to pick a position and say, it's no big deal or it's the end of the world. And they look for evidence to support that, that, you know, that belief. And that's, you know, that's an argument I have no energy for. I just want people to be safe. And um, if we don't know what's going on, it's probably better to err a little bit on the side of caution. And I think, I think what we can learn is that one, you know, one treatment, uh, you know, one, one way of dealing with it is not the best way for the entire country. So uh, you know, an urban city is gonna have a certain set of rules that um, the town of Scobie, Montana, that ha might have, you know, 700 people is gonna have a different set of rules. Mm -hmm. um, and it factor in how much, you know, their access to hospital beds and things like that. Um, I think we had a, a knee jerk reaction that I think we're gonna learn from in the future. I think 50 years from now, we'll look back on that and go, okay, we reacted this way. And that was good. It probably saved a lot of lives, but we can do it in a more nuanced way um, because we have the communication capacity to do this um, and treat areas a little differently based on their population. I think, I think we'll learn that. My fear is, um, you know, eventually, as, as Bill Gates has said like 10 years ago in a TED Talk, this is, this is you know, we knew this was coming. This is the most known problem that we were going to have. It was only a matter of time. And, um, epidemiologists have been saying this for years, but we, as a country, we react. We don't um, prevent very well. And um, yeah, my fear is, you know, if this was a hemorrhagic fever, um, you know, this would be devastating. And uh, not to scare anybody, but um, you know, eventually we're going to be hit with something much more severe. Um, and I hope, you know, I hope, I hope people un under, in, in Japan, people wear masks because they're a conscientious person. And if they have a cold, they don't want to spread it. And in people wear masks in the U S it was thought that you, you're, you're a germaphobe and you're, afraid of catching something from someone else. And so people are so self-conscious about wearing masks and there's this, you know, like if I wear a mask, it must mean I'm weak or something like that. Um, it means you're looking out for your neighbor. And I think we need more of that and less of, um, you know, I have a right to go and infect everybody around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for answering that. That's, it's, there's a lot going on in the world for sure. And I'm sure- It's a busy time. It is. And, um, I, I think we have 25 other questions, Sarah. Does yeah, that look right? So we'll see how some of them may be the duplicates. Sarah, how about another question from our fabulous attendees? Of course. Um, a little bit about your writing process. Kat would like to know, as a writer of historical fiction, do you prefer to research before writing a story? Mm. And if so, when do you know to stop and get writing? <laughs> oh, good. Um, uh, I do tons of research before, so I'll have a, an idea, a concept, and then I will just do, I'll do months of research. Um, and if I, you know, visiting archives and museums and reading books and watching, uh, you know, taped oral histories, interview people when I can, um, and I collect notes and I cobble together all the stuff and I begin writing when I have so much information that it's just more than I can handle. I'm afraid if I don't start writing, I'm gonna, for, I'm just gonna forget stuff. And then along the way, I will, I will research as I go because I'll hit something and I'll just be like, okay, I need, an, I need an answer to this because this came up and I don't, I don't know. And so I'll, you know, pull the car over, get out, and do that bit of research, get back in, and then keep writing. Good question. Thanks, Kat, for that. Yeah, question. that is a good question. Thank you, Sarah. 
Is there another one? Karen would like to know, where do you look for inspiration for your characters and or plots? Hmm. Um, boy, for plots, it's usually a curiosity. It's something that I'm just, I'm just very interested in. And, and uh, for me, uh, epigenetics or the thought of inherited trauma has been talked about in um, Native American communities forever. Um, historical trauma. It's now talked about a lot uh, with Holocaust survivors and now in therapeutic circles. Uh, I think if anyone has a therapist, I have a therapist, if you ask them about uh, genetic trauma or inherited trauma, um, you know, that's something that's been talked about forever. And so I was curious about that. And usually that curiosity will lead to, you know, sort of a uh, a plot point or something that's the fulcrum that I build a story on. As far as characters, I don't really base them on people. Um, I tend to write really simple characters and then just just wind them up and let them, you know, go about the stage and bump into things and see what kind of sparks fly off. And then I with my characters, I tend to know sort of a central uh, thing about them. They're, you know, a character's um, you know, noble or a character is uh, selfish or, you know, those kind of things. But I don't, I don't go too deep and I just kind of make that up as I go. And that's part of the fun of being a writer is there's a, there's a discovery process on the page and, and it, it either feels right or it doesn't. And sometimes I'll write something. I'm like, okay, this just doesn't feel like this character, this character's out in the weeds somewhere. And I'll just have to cut those pages and, and get back to the root of that character. Oh, very good. Thanks for that response. Great question, Karen. Sarah, what's another one? Susan would like to know what type of resources do you use to research historical characters that you write about? Oh, okay. Um, boy, what do I not use? Um, I, I come at it from all angles. So say if I'm writing a story set in 1938 in, uh, I'm just going to make this up, Detroit, I will I'll get uh, old phone books off of eBay from Detroit, 1938. I'll get old city maps. I will get old high school yearbooks to and see what people write to each other in those yearbooks, the phraseology. I get newspapers from that time period and I read them because you sort of pick up the, um, you know, how people, the vernacular. Um, and then if I'm, you know, if I'm writing about a certain subject, I will find every nonfiction book I can. And I tend to, I tend to, trip into books no one people don't normal people don't read i'm reading for a very, to find a very specific answer to a very specific historical question and these tend to be like very dry out of print academic um uh you know books that i have to track down and then if i can i i go there i visit historical societies um i do research there um often in their archives and then i interview people a lot um in person preferably um occasionally i'll do it like this, but um, I'll usually fly and set up appointments and meet people for coffee. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. And if you ever are writing about Detroit, I was born there. So, <laughs> all right. Go Tigers. Nice. All right. Sarah, any other questions? Yes. Karen would like to know Jamie, how mm -hmm. long have you lived in Montana mm -hmm. and why did you decide to leave Seattle, which seems to have such an important place in your life? Mm, yeah. I've now been in Montana 20 years, um, which is, where did the time go? <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Um, you know, I, I came here from Hawaii. So I, I actually moved from Seattle to Hawaii and I, I lived and worked there for a number of years and then was offered a job here. And it seemed like a, you know, it seemed like a really nice place to raise a family. And, and it was, and it still is. And it's also, I, lo I love the outdoors. I love the recreation here in Montana. Um, and that's when I'm not writing, I'm usually out, you know, trying to get to the top of some mountain or in my kayak or something like that. Um, leaving Seattle was, was hard. And I, I thought I, I, I thought, always thought I would move back to Seattle at some point. And um, I don't, I don't think I ever will. Um, the, cause, because the Seattle I want to move back to doesn't exist. The Seattle I want to move back to is the Seattle of my, you know, my childhood. And there's a, uh, a song lyric by Jason Isbell, who I think is a, just an incredible songwriter, but the lyric goes, um, daddy said the river will always take you home, but the river can't take you back in time and daddy's dead and gone. And that's how I feel about Seattle. So I, 
I write about Seattle because I don't live there and, and, I, and I miss it. And Ivan Doig, who passed away a couple years ago, was a, a Montana author. He moved to Seattle spent the balance of his life in Seattle and wrote about Montana. So I, I get that. And when, when Ivan and I first met, we talked about that. Um, and we shook hands. We thought, you know, maybe our, our minds would jump into each other's bodies because that's, you know, where our hearts were. Oh, very good. Thank you for that response. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that being stated, I'm in Seattle all the time. I'm in Seattle. Well, not now, but usually eight times a year and it's, right. it's not that far. And I, I sit on the board of a museum out there and I have family and so I'm just over there. Very good. All right, next question, Sarah. Okay. Um, Susan uh, is wondering, you said that you have been speaking with students and classes a couple of times a week. What has been the takeaway from the students that have been required to read Hotel on the Corner Bitter and Sweet? What seems to be the most popular question that they ask you? Mm. <laughs> it's always they want to know what happens next um like are you going to write a sequel or or where are henry and keiko now um it, it, that's always the question um i it's been it's been great uh you know you know i, I raised a lot of, my wife and i have a blended family of six children so we, we raised six teenagers and i visit lots of schools and <sighs> You know, our, unfortunately, for, for the teachers out there, you'll understand and maybe appreciate that, you know, our, our curriculum, as far as literature, is, is, is kind of stuck in, in the past. And it's really hard to change. Um, and when teachers are allowed to read something that's a little more contemporary, and especially if it has young protagonists, those are always more popular. Um, of Mice and Men is a great book. It is for many students like swallowing aspirin without water. And, um, and they prefer Catcher in the Rye and Kill a Mockingbird because the protagonists are younger and they, they can appreciate that. And so Hotel has young protagonists and I think that helps, but they always wanna know what the older Henry and the older Keiko are doing right now. Mm -hmm. I do too, just so you know, I, I'm, Me I'm too. <laughs> You know, before we ask the next question, Jamie, is there anything that you want to read um, to oh. us tonight? Anything you're interested in sharing? <laughs> we can, I can yeah. not just draw this question. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll just read the, like just a page or and a half, just a part of a prologue of this, of this new book. I, Fabulous. What, what I do with all my books is I, I, I read as I'm writing them, I will read them in public at book events or open mic nights or things like that. Um, hard to do when there's a COVID shutdown. So this is, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, right, we're, on it. we're on it. And everyone, you can respond via chat or <laughs> Q&A. Okay. Um, this is uh, just a prologue with this character of Afong Moy, who was a, a real woman. Um, this little snippet begins in China. Um, the book is not most of the book is not set in China, it's set um, in, in the US and some, um, some is in China, some is in the UK. Um, and I'll just, I'm just gonna read it here. So I'm, okay. it's on my lap. It's, this is, it's funny because I'm reading from the actual document that I was working on this afternoon. This is the live document that I'm reading from. Um, and this is set in 1834. For most of my childhood, I thought I must have been a horrible man in my previous life to be reborn as a woman. I must have been cruel to be reborn powerless. I must have been greedy to have come back as property. I must have been shiftless to have had my feet bound in this life. I must have been vehement to be forced to marry an old man that I'd never met, never seen, unable to forget, the young poet I cared for and dreamt about. I must have been unfaithful for wedlock to be a padlock in my future home, a prison. Aethong, my mother called me and I walked carefully in my lotus shoes into her room. I have news about your wedding. She pressed her lips together as though she did not want the words to escape like horses she could not rein in. It was in these moments that I'd learned to not show my distaste for my arranged marriage, to not wear my doubts about the old matchmaker who wore court necklaces with fat pearls and earrings of jade and gilt silver, gifts that everyone in my village knew had been encouragements for her to favor the marital interests of the Yu family. 
When I was younger, I'd heard the stories how the U were so powerful they could realign the stars, but in reality, the stars did not move for them. Celestial beings did not whisper in the matchmaker's ears, for if they did, they would have chastised her for taking bribes and placing my sisters in U homes as servants and concubines. Day U is gone, my Alma said. Gone? He was killed in a mudslide, and they found his body two years ago, or two days ago. I felt something inside that hadn't been there before, hope, but I held my breath. I remembered the same feeling when my Yinyan died, Yinyan grandmother, died two years ago. During her vigil, I sat with my grandmother's body, and when I touched her arm, her eyes opened, and she looked at me. I ran to the window and shouted for my Amma, who came running, but by the time she arrived, my Yinyan's eyes had half closed, and she continued to stare at the spot where I'd been. That's when I learned that the dead never really leave us. Now, as I listened, I pictured a funeral procession for Day Yu, his wives wailing and rending their clothing, a tearful competition to see who could profess the most grief and curry favor with their mother-in-law. I saw him reaching out to me, snatching my wrist, grinding his yellow teeth as he said, why don't you cry for me, Afong? My ama looked pale. The wedding will proceed in two days as planned. I imagine my Yinyan's eyes staring up at me, her lips moving silently, telling me to run. But who will I marry? My voice trembled. Her lips, my voice trembled as I asked, and my thoughts found their way into the arms of Yao Han, who I'd hoped to wed since I was eight years old, even though he was poor and his father had gambled away his meager inheritance. Johan was gentle and had written tales about our spirits meeting on the dot of the unicorn's horn, how if our hearts were gold we should fear no fire. He always said, we have many lives, Afong, and life truly begins when we realize we have only one. You will marry Day Yu, my Ama, closed her eyes as though seeing my reaction was too much to bear. Your father already spent your bride price, so you will be delivered and married as planned. You will enter the Yu home as a widow. I opened my mouth, but could not speak. Two days from now, you will wear white instead of red, my Amma informed me, and I will use this time we have left to teach you how to mourn properly. My Amma spoke, but we both knew I didn't need a lesson in grief because I was born a woman. I'll stop right there. So no. let me share that with you. No, <laughs> don't stop right there. So that's why, everyone, we buy Jamie Ford's book. Thank you. So we'll have to look. Hold on, I have to do a chat too. Let's see here. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, we'll see if there's any. Actually, Sarah, ask. Um, maybe ask the next question, and okay. then we can see if there are any any people that want to respond to that beautiful prologue. When now? When can we look for that? Do you think? What the book? Um, I know you haven't finished writing it yet. Yeah, I'm. They they want to publish it next year. That's the plan. If I turn it in in a month or two, that it'll come out next year. Um, but they prefer to launch me and, you know, to, to have me, my book come out in the spring rather than the fall, um, for a variety of reasons. And, um, if they just can't make it happen, then it'll be pushed to the next year, unfortunately, which is, I'm, I'm sorry. I wish, I wish, I wish books could come out sooner. Um, but they, but they don't, they, they, they print up a catalog that goes out to libraries and bookstores and, you know, there's a sales channel that they have to uh, line up and, and and jump on board. And um, that's why it takes so long. Yeah, that's okay. We'll wait. We'll wait for it. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, are there any messages about the prologue on chat? Uh, yes, everybody is just gushing <laughs> about it. Aww. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, well, actually, if you... If you okay. Um, do you mind if I read just one more little piece? Uh, okay. Okay, we're just gonna, I mean, actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, sorry, I Re readings, I, I, I'm nervous about readings because they tend to put people to sleep and I don't wanna do that, but um, yeah. It, in, sleepy, but I will defer your choice, your choice. In, in China on occasions when there was an arranged marriage and the, the man died, um, oftentimes the, the, the wife would become a ghost bride and they would just marry in a ceremony without without the husband there and she would enter the home as a widow um, and be expected to be childless for the rest of her life. Um, and I mean, having an arranged marriage of not and never meeting the person until, you know, you see them right before you're about to be, you know, to be wedded to them. That's a special kind of uh, experience. Um, but right. to do that as uh, an unwanted person um, and, 
in, in many ways, those people, ghost brides were seen as bearers of bad luck. Um, so they were, they were not liked. Oh, wow. That's just heartbreaking and fascinating too. We look forward to that very much. Cool. Thank okay. you. Um, and Jamie, what we can do is mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get some more questions and then we okay. can stay on and you, so you and I can read through the, the chat to you know a little bit after if you're able sure. so sarah you're up what's next i would like to know if you would ever write about a place like gettysburg yeah you know i uh, i wrote three books about seattle and i i, I just wanted three three sounded like a, a a trilogy or a round number um there is one character that appears in all three of my books he's just a, a cameo character a man named dr luke who was the actual uh doctor that worked in chinatown for for decades and so i see those books as being part of the same world um this new book it takes place in uh kunming china it takes place in seattle it takes place in uh england it takes place in baltimore um where else um, San Francisco. And so it, it takes place in a bunch of different locations. And so this book is, it's just a bigger box of crayons for me. My, my other books, um, you know, my first book is one point of view character. My second book is two point of view characters. And this book will probably have like five. Um, well, I mean, it currently has five and there's a, an epilogue point of view. And so it's, um, it's a, it's just a bigger, uh, a bigger playpen for me, a bigger sandbox. And I, I could, you know, like Woody Allen right, sets all his books or sets all his movies in New York City. I could set all my books in Seattle, but it feels very limiting. And, um, you know, there, there is a desire to like, there's more hidden stories there and I just need to keep digging, but there's hidden stories everywhere. And so um, it's, it's, I think it's more fun for me and, and also more challenging um, to, you know, write stories set further afield. Plus I get to travel to some different places for research. So that's always good. I think there are many more stories to tell from in Gettysburg. So come on down. <laughs> I think there are probably better people than me to tell those stories. There's some good, like Robert Hicks is probably uh, who I would, I, I would turn to, but thank you. Sarah, any other comments or questions? Well, the audience would like to know if you have a working <laughs> title for the book. Oh, yeah, I always have a working title, and then I, I name my children after they're born. So I, I always name my books when they're done. And um, and so the working title, and who knows, the working titles may survive, but for right now, it's just called uh, Tomorrow Dorothy. Hmm, intriguing. Mm -hmm. Very good. Sarah, any other questions? Uh, Susan would like to know, she is just curious about your draw to Asian culture and characters. What sure. do you think pulls you to this culture to write about them? Yeah, you know, um, well, the, the easy answer is I'm half Chinese. So um, my dad was full Chinese, spoke Cantonese fluently. Um, and I wrote Hotel after my dad passed away. And really, I wrote the book as almost a love letter to the neighborhood that my dad grew up in, in a neighborhood that's really near and dear to me. Um, and also to explore his childhood because my dad wore one of those I am Chinese buttons during World War II. Um, Cause he was the same age um, as Henry during World War II. Um, well, actually like a, maybe a year older, but, um, and so it, it, it works twofold for me. It, it lets me be indulgent and explore my own family history, which for the research, it just, it just helps me to understand, you know, uh, the struggles and triumphs of, of my ancestors. And there's a lot to learn there. And also, I think we're in a time where it's useful and enlightening to read about other people's experiences. I think you know, I'm in a book club. I've been in a book club for nine years now, uh, a guy's book club. And, and we do that. we will like, okay, we've been reading a lot of these books and we sort of vector in on like books guys would read. And we're like, okay, we really need to read, um, <laughs> something else and we will jump out of that lane um and you, one guy when he was hosting he noticed that we had we went for like a year and we had read nothing but books by male authors you know Cormac McCarthy and um Larry McMurtry and things like that and so when he was hosting we always vote on the next book he brought books from only female authors so we would have to and and 
and, and we read uh, people of the book. And then there was another time where someone thought, you know, we read, need to read the quintessential uh, women's book club book that are, that are popular right now. So our, our choices were Eat, Pray, Love, um, Wild, and there were a couple others and we chose Wild. And so um, I write about um, multicultural things because I'm interested in it. And I think sometimes book clubs and schools and readers and just other people, it's, it's an opportunity to put your, you know, your feet in someone else's shoes and walk around and, and experience something else. And I think when you do that, it exercises your empathy muscles. And right now, you know, in our society, there's a deficit of empathy. And so anything I can do to, I, I really do think, um, I, I think sometimes my, my wife put, the, put it this way, because she's a nurse, but if a book has a lot of empathy and kindness and people solve, solving their problems through um, tender heartedness instead of hard heartedness, those books become like vaccines in our culture. You inject them into the body of our culture and hopefully it can inoculate people uh, from racism, from um, sexism, from homophobia, from ageism, from, from all kinds of things. Um, yeah, like Mark Twain said that travel is the antidote to bigotry and we can travel with books. Absolutely, absolutely. Well stated. Sarah, is there one more question? Yes, the last question. Okay. As a supporter of public libraries, mm -hmm. what do you recommend we do to support public libraries in our communities? Wow. Um, I'm on the foundation board of my local library here. Um, I have a meeting next week on Zoom. Um, to support your libraries, <sighs> I mean, the, the, the fundamental thing is when, when you have lo levies that support funding for libraries, you know, please vote yes. Um, mill levies and things like that. But also use your libraries. Um, that's what they're for. And then a lot of times, I think we, we reach it, you know, when we have little kids, we use the libraries for a certain reason. Um, when we're older, perhaps we use them less. Um, if we're more affluent, we buy, li you know, buy books and download them and, and you don't need them. But library patronage, either in person or through donation or supporting library events. Um, it's just really important. I, I mean, just imagine if every library in every community in America just disappeared overnight. Um, what that would do to our society? What would that do to literacy? What would that do to access to the internet for people who, you know, are a, a woman who's living in a, a battered woman's shelter who doesn't have a phone, who doesn't have access to the internet? And she can go to the library and she can use the computer and she can do a resume and she can apply for a job. Um, so many jobs now, you apply online. Most of them, uh, especially uh, jobs for people living in poverty. And the library is the only computer they can get their hands on. So libraries really are a stepping stone, uh, you know, to a, a better quality of life. And so um, just being mindful of that, just because you don't use the library doesn't mean it isn't really important in your community. And I think there are people that, you know, sometimes I will go to a party and there's that guy who's, who says, I haven't read a book since high school. And he, he thinks that's something you should <laughs> brag about. <laughs> and it's not, it's not something you should brag about. And it's that the kind of guy that's like, why do we need libraries? We need libraries um, the same reason we need homeless shelters if you're not homeless, because someone else is homeless. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of our purpose here is to help each other. Beautiful answer. And of course, we're extremely grateful for you, Jamie, helping. Thank you the for having me. Library system. And for each of you at home, <laughs> um, your willingness to buy a ticket tonight is so greatly appreciated by me and my colleagues. Go Adams County. Um, yeah, thank you for helping us raise funds for our most urgent needs. Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to be a fundraiser during a pandemic. <laughs> it's, a, it's a struggle, I know. Yeah, so for your, your library, your local nonprofit, thank you for supporting them and, uh, and keep up that um, great charity. We sure appreciate it. So, um, Jamie, thank you. We look forward to reading your next book. Um, thanks for sharing your time and talents, especially as you're on deadline. We're going to be rooting for you. We're, we're definitely rooting for you. Um, best wishes to you and your kids and Leisha, and, and thank you for everything. So, again, I'm John Smith. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you, family and friends of mine out there as well. Love you. And... 
So Jamie and I are just going to be casually reading, if it's okay with you guys. Okay. You are welcome. This is the official end okay. of okay. this webinar. And then okay. Jamie and I want to be able to, to see your, your messages um, real quickly. So feel free to enjoy the rest of your Friday evening. Thank you for joining us. And we'll just take a few minutes. Um, but I will wave to you who are leaving. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, see what, we'll see what people are saying, which is kind of weird, but... But Jamie, otherwise you won't get to see these these love notes. Yeah, I, I can't see them unfortunately because the my original window um, disappeared when we switched back. I'm I'm sorry. I, I might have pressed something wrong on my end. It could no, you didn't. totally be my fault. I'm totally just gonna call a uh, call a lifeline here. Um, okay. Tom, Tom, do you think if Jamie logged out and called back in, that might work? Okay. I probably won't see the old messages. You know what I mean? Like I'll yeah, probably see what was current. It's so strange, and I'm. It is. I okay. apologize. For, my I'm gonna put on my glasses. Um, like tiny print. Okay. Well, let's see. Um. Yeah. So. I don't know. We did record it, so you can you can see a little bit. I I don't think the chat's recorded, of course. He's going to call back in and see. Okay. I'm muting. That was weird. Did it work? Um, I, I didn't do it on purpose, but I think I logged out. Um, oh, <laughs> I thought you did it on purpose. I did not. Oh, okay. Do you see I, anything different? I don't okay. see any question. No, wait. Let me open that. It's a different chat. So yeah, um, at the bottom of yeah, your screen. yeah, I don't see the old. The, I, I can't see the old ones. You could copy and paste them, maybe. Yep. But I don't. I'll figure it out. Yeah, okay, we'll so. we'll do that. Um, it it may be because I have multiple monitors and I and I switch from one monitor to the other. No problem. No problem. I will. I'll figure out how to to do that so you can so you can see those. So. Um, yeah, so bye everyone. Thank you. Happy Friday. And so Jamie and I are going to turn off our video. And again, thank you so very, very much for supporting the library system. Best wishes to you.